Welcome. You drop a note in chat. Let us know how you're doing. Hope your week is off to a really good start. Okay, so you are going to notice that I turned on closed captioning for tonight's session. And um, so one of the things I'm going to start doing is prior to the start, you're not required to be here. So you're only required to be in attendance when the official hour starts. So I will start the recording early, but I'm gonna get started 10 minutes to the hour with reviews. And I've been watching test scores, as I mentioned. And so we have not covered piecework yet. For those of you who have taken it, and the majority of you have, the, um, the overall, the, the APHR practice assessment that covers all units, I'm getting questions about piece rate. So we haven't covered it yet. So it's no wonder, unless you're a, a compensation professional, that it's a head scratcher for you. So I wanted to go through it tonight. Um, and just rest assured, we are going to cover this again. I'll also send a copy of these additional slides that I put together out to you because they're just some very important things for you to keep in mind. And welcome again to, to those of you who are, who are just joining. Good to have you here. Okay, so let's talk about piece rate. We'll get into this again when we get into compensation and benefits. Um, so a piecework job pays 75 cents per piece. So think about, if you will, um, um, a manufacturing environment. And let's say Jess is responsible for producing um, a chip, a microchip that um, goes into a device, okay? a cell phone. And Jess gets paid 75 cents per piece. Oh, 75 cents per piece. Jess works 55 hours per week and produces 680 pieces. The question is how much are Jess's earnings for the week? So that's your question on the test. And you have some multiple choice options. And one would think maybe you could just multiply do some multiplication and, and arrive at the answer. But I wanna put this out to you all and welcome to those of you just joining. A piece, so it's piecework, right? So paying 75 cents per piece. What information do we need to calculate Jess's earnings? Just go ahead and come off mute. How much she gets paid an hour? Yeah, we're missing that, right? So it's, it's like, here's where the head scratcher comes in. It's like, um, but I don't, how much does she make per hour? I don't know. And nobody's late. I'm just starting with a bit of a review, with a review of piece rate. And I am recording this. So you can go back and catch the recording. So you're not missing anything. Just a preview. We're going to cover this in compensation and benefits. Um, but I noticed a lot of people were asking me, reaching out. And saying, I got this wrong. Why? Okay, so the information we need, first of all, we need to know our hourly rate, but we have some information. We know she gets paid 75 cents per piece. We know she produced 680 pieces. And I'm going to say they, we know they worked 55 hours per week. Okay, so these are important pieces of the puzzle. Super important. I want you to write this down, I want you to stamp it in your memory. The very first step in determining Jess's weekly earnings is that you have to um, calculate the hourly rate. You have to figure out what is, well, what is this person's hourly rate? How do we do that? This is also important. This is the formula. I'll send these slides out. I like to write things myself. It helps me to remember. So 
do you guys, do you all remember learning PEMDAS? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, the order of operations for mathematical equations. So whatever is done in, whatever is in parentheses is done first. And then we're, so we're gonna get that. We're gonna, and then we're gonna divide that by the number of hours worked. And this is going to become our hourly rate. Okay, so applying that formula to, to calculate the hourly rate, again, we know 75, oops, that shouldn't say 0 0.75, 75 pieces. Um, times the rate. Oh goodness, I'm so sorry. I um I I put 55 here, but I actually used 680. If if you do the math, I don't know why I'm sorry, that's that should not say that should say 680. Sorry about that. I will fix it before I send these slides to you. Um so 0.75 and if you got a calculator, grab it. 0 0.75 times 680 equals 510. And remember then we're going to divide that by the number of hours worked. So we know just worked 55 hours. $9.27 is the hourly rate. So jot that down. $9.27 is the hourly rate. Um, okay, so do we have to pay overtime? You can come off mute, share in chat. Yes, over 40 hours for hourly. Why? Why 40 hours? I don't know. <laughs> the law, right? And, and tell me who's talking. I'm uh, Lanisha. Lanisha, thank you, because I can't see the name. Um, okay, so you're right, it's 40 hours, because that's the federal law. Anything worked in excess of 40 hours in a week is considered to be overtime. So the answer but, is yes. But that's if they're not an exempt employee, correct? Like for hourly employees? For hourly employees, yep. Okay. Yes, we'll get into that detail, that fun detail too. So how do we calculate the overtime rate? Time and a half, right? Yep, overtime is paid at time and a half. Thank you, Lanisha. Okay, mm -hmm. so time and a half, $9.27 is the hourly rate times 1.5 equals 13.90. 13.90 is the overtime rate Jess worked 40 regular hours, so we're going to apply the regular rate, and then we're going to apply the overtime rate to the 15 hours, and then we're going to add those two together so that the weekly earnings are 579.30. I want to ask a quick question. Is there yes. a reason that you didn't round up to 1391? Well, when I, yes, so when I, um, when I did the calculation, the initial calculation, the hourly rate was 9.272727. So I kept that at 927. Um, now tell me, was I supposed to round? Well, yeah, when I did payroll, 9.27 times 10 and a half is 13.905. So that should be 13.91. 0.905 though. Yes. Right? So the five, you would round it up five. to one because you don't. Oh, who is this talking? Lydia. Sorry. Lydia, thank you. No, you're the best. You're absolutely right. My, my, my right. accountant brain is coming out. I apologize. I'm so happy it is. <laughs> I am so happy it is. Thank you so much. Yes, you are absolutely right. And thank you for that. Um, yeah, so the so this should be 931. So these numbers are going to be off. I'll, I'll fix it. Thank you so much, Lydia. Again, um, I'm always so scared to walk you all through math stuff because I've already told you math is not my strongest suit, but <laughs> the most important thing is that you have the formula, you do need to do the rounding, um, but you're not, you're not going to find a, a response that's a couple pennies off as you saw in the, in the pretest. So, okay, we, it's a little over the top of the hour. And so for those of you who are just joining, you didn't come late. You didn't, what I did is I started, um, with a review, I started early, about 10 minutes early, which I'm going to do from this point on to review a concept. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a look at your pretests and I'm just looking for commonalities where people are tend to struggle. And I'm considering the emails that I receive as well. And based on, you know, the, 
factor, like what questions am I getting and where are you hit, missing the mark? I'm gonna review um, key concepts. I also want you to know that just take that piece, the, the questions that are coming to you in that APHR pre-assessment pre that includes all of the units, give yourselves a break when you, when you miss an answer. You haven't seen that material yet. So unless you're like Lydia and you have an accounting background or, or a payroll background, compensation background, well, you know, you may not have that. Uh, it's okay. So um, I wanna officially welcome you. We're starting unit two. I hope that review was helpful. And if you didn't catch the whole thing, you can go back and listen to the recording and I'll post the slides that I put together separately um, in the hive. Um, and I do want to apologize. I am behind on posting the summary for lesson four, a little under the weather over um, the la latter part of the week and weekend. So um, actually in a house where two people have COVID and interestingly enough, my mom and I don't. So um, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very strange, but anyhow, but we both don't feel well. Um, okay. So I just want to make an announcement that tomorrow Jen is hosting a tutorial, study tips and recommendations. And several of you have responded to the question about study group um, getting together and people are interested. I haven't seen anyone who has um, raised their hand to say, yes, I'll coordinate. So um, let me just chew on that a little bit. And I'm going to email a list out to everybody, though, this week, and I'll give you some suggestions for how you can get started. OK, so who's ready to talk about learning and development? Me, OK. This guy, super duper. All right, you're here. Hey, um, Sydney, ask me that when we get to the end. I, I, um, yeah. All right. Oh, fantastic. Well, learning and development is my passion. And um, the overall exam weight for this sec, uh, for this unit is 15%. And um, let's talk about learning and development in the organization or training and development in the organization. You'll hear it referred to kind of interchangeably. Um, and as always, we start out with a sort of a high level overview and then start to so sort of, and then start to dive into more specific topics around training and development. You'll see these two objectives on the screen also listed in your book on page 95, along with some additional objectives. So we are going to touch on um, the ADDI model and um, different types of transfer of training and um, all kinds of other fun stuff. So what is the difference? You read this in your book and love for you to share. What is the difference between training and education? You can come off mute. You can share in chat. If I remember correctly, uh, education is more broad. Yes. Thank training you for that. More specific yeah. for a job, education is more broad where it can transfer to all kinds of positions. Super. Okay. And in chat, I see general knowledge versus specific skills. Education covers a long span. Awesome. So you're leading me into the next component. So um, I think you've all got that pretty down um, pretty well. We're going to talk a little bit more about these distinctions as we move forward. So the systems model of training assumes that there is a systematic approach to training um, that should be followed. So this is sort of, again, the high level systems model of training. And then we'll look at a specific model. There's only one that's discussed um, you know, in detail in the book, but there are many different um, models of training. So systems model of training takes a three, three phase approach or a three pronged approach. Um, the first phase is the assessment phase. And that is essentially like, what are the needs? Um, is there really a need for training? And if there is, 
um, what is this training intended to solve? What type of problem? So assessing the training needs, the resources to identify essentially the problem, like what is the true, the real problem that's occurring? Um, and how are things going to be different as a result of this training, which leads you to the identification of the training objectives from which you develop the training criteria. So that's all part of the assessment phase. The training and development phase consists of pretests. If you are going to pretest, so have you? Did you pretest in this class? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And always feel free to just unmute yourself and and chat in uh, and use the chat. So yeah. So pretest, right? We just talked about that. Um, that essentially gives you a baseline as the trainer for where your participants are. Um, and then based on the training objectives, you're going to select your training methods, your learning principles, uh, your training materials. We're gonna get into all of this in much more detail and conducting the training. So that's part of the training and development phase. And then at the very end and often overlooked but critically important is the evaluation phase. Monitoring training and essential, your learning objectives become the criteria by which you measure the results of the training. And feedback is continuous. So I would, you know, at the bottom here where it says feedback, I would, you know, enhance that to say continuous feedback loop. Um, I can't tell you how many times I was designing a training while it was being delivered, which is, uh, which is good and, and not so good. It's, there's a lot of pressure, but it's good because you're getting that, lot, that instantaneous feedback where what I mean is, let's say you have like uh, this class, okay? And let's say, you know, the class wasn't developed yet. It is, we've delivered this class many times, um, but let's say it just, it was brand new, hadn't been developed yet. That would mean I would be like, one or two modules ahead. So this week I'd be developing uh, for next week, lesson six and seven. At the same time, I would be evaluating how it went for lessons four and five. Okay. All right. Um, so the ADDIE model is one of the specific mo training models. How many of you, any of you worked with a different training model other than ADDIE? And by the way, as you look on the screen here, you'll see these different, um, the different stages or steps in the ADDIE model related to the systems model of training that we just looked at. So um, there's, the, the, um, there's also SAM. So SAM successive approximation method has become very popular um, in recent years. Um, SAM is actually borrowed from, do we have any computer programmers or anyone who knows a computer programmer lives with one maybe we actually borrow sam from the um from uh, from programmers designers if you will so um all right assessment is the first stage in addy so we're assessing we talked about this before, but um, this is where you're identifying performance gaps. So actual performance, desired performance, the desired performance where you want people to be feeds into your, your goals and objectives for training. And then the development phase is determining, are we gonna buy or are we gonna create? My personal preference is always buy, I mean, always buy, <laughs> always create. Um, because you're tailoring it. So off the shelf training is great for what types of training? Where I just go and buy a training that everybody sees. I can't customize it. I can't do anything with it. What type of topics do you think would be good? I'm, I'm thinking like harassment training, discrimination training, because they're standard that are, you know, learn the federal law, right? 
Whereas with um, soft skills training, management and leadership development, for example, you, you'd want to be able to customize to fit your organization. So you could do, you could do a both and um, purchase and uh, with, with authorization and rights to modify. Safety training is another really good example. Yeah. So of standardized, like off the shelf type training that you can purchase. Okay. So um, implementation is the actual delivery. And again, evaluation is the results to the course objectives. Did the intended behavior change? Yeah. Ethics training. That's another good example. And by the way, for those types of things, I encourage you to, you know, because training and development takes a lot of time. Development time takes a long time to do it right. So obviously, if we take time up front to do a needs assessment and we identify the problems that we're going to fix and the learning objectives that are going to close the gaps in um, performance, so it could be skill-based, it could also be um, behavior-based, combination of both. But ideally, in order, well, when we do our evaluation, we need what we're doing really essentially is we're asking the question: Did the training stick? Did did the training transfer into the real world? And so there are really three um, transfer of trainings that are possible that we're looking for, and. Um, When the, the stimulus, so just looking at the exhibit in your book, let's see that it's on page 98. You can follow along there. And again, just important to study these exhibits. But so we're looking at the stimulus and environment for the training. So this is like where the training was, was delivered. What was the stimulus in the training environment? And what response did the participants learn? So when the stimulus and the response are similar, there's a large positive transfer. And this is where you wanna live. When you're a training and development professional, this is, this is what, what you're striving for. This is what you're striving to attain. Um, similarly, if you have a, um, Get rid of that, get back to my little marker here. Um, if the stimulus environment is different, but the learned response is similar, you'll have a small positive transfer. So you can still be here. Um, I'll give you an example of, of a, a training that I did where this just to kind of highlight the what happened. Um, and, and you, this may be familiar to you. We had a, a piece of software that we used for documentation of all the health coaching interactions. And so I was training our health coaches how to document all of their coaching interactions. And um, a, Uh, about a week into the training, we learned that there had been a software upgrade and that had not been communicated. So there was a new release of the software. The software had been upgraded and, you know, most things stayed the same, but some things changed. So they're learned. So the, so the stimulus ended up being slightly different, but the learned responses were the same. So there's a smaller positive transfer, but the positive transfer still took place. Um, in the case of the stimulus environment being similar, but the learned response is different, you're gonna get a, a large negative transfer of training. A large negative transfer of training occurs in that scenario. Um, so that means the training learns something inappropriate for a new situation. So let's say, you know, um, just using that same example, um, 
let's say as a second part of that training, the health coaches were trained on the protocol required to um, respond to, uh, we had critical issues that we had to escalate. Okay. So, um, and, and we trained them on how to respond to critical incidents. So the critical incidents, let's say, um, they really were the critical incidents, but the mode of responding changed. Let's say someone in, in legal updated the protocol based on some, you know, a new requirement by Medicare, let's say, in a way that we had to respond to members. In that case, there'd be a large negative transfer because what they learned is not at all what they're supposed to be doing. You don't wanna live there. This is like, oh my goodness, it's, it's out the window. So can I ask a quick question? How would you correct that then? They would have to be retrained. Okay. So you just create a new training in the correct way. Yep. Okay. Yes. And, and we'll, we'll talk about when we get further into this unit, we'll talk about uh, memory and learning and unlearning and what you have to do in that type of a scenario where you, you know, basically have to get people to unlearn what you told them to do and learn something new. Oh, good question. And then where there's no transfer, I mean, it's, it's just, it's a mess, a, a, a total waste of time. So we, we really want to live in, in, of course, the positive transfers. The book gives a really good example of learning to drive. All right. So learning styles. So now we're kind of the, just think about the development of materials. Um, People learn differently. How many of you know your learning style? Would you say you're visual? In other words, like you would say to someone, show me how to do that. That's a very visual word. So you can look at, listen to people's verbs um, and they'll indicate how they, how they learn, what their learning preference is for that particular thing. So I, let's say you explain a task to someone and the person says, can you show me how to do that? They're most likely a visual learner. They learn best through seeing. So listen to people's verbs when you're when you're training or teaching. Even your 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 um, your non-work people, similar type of thing. Um, auditory and and so visual learners want things like this: the slide presentations, right? Give you the video for calculating yield ratio, um, in which you also saw her diagram. Um, the yield ratio calculation. And that's another one we'll revisit because I know that's still a, um, questions are coming up about that. So next week, or, or Wednesday before class, we'll do some yield calculations. Um, auditory learners learn best through hearing. So people who are auditory learners will say something to you like, tell me more. So the, the verbs that they use are, you know, again, an indication. So these are like listening words, tell, explain. And they love going to lectures and they listen and, and it's, it's a good way for them to learn. Um, they like to actively participate in discussions and listen to recordings. So audiobooks would be, you know, really good. Um, kinesthetic learners are the ones who do best by, it's, it's like, let me do it. Like, let me do it. Um, let me practice. Let me try. Give me a chance to do that. Do. Um, so they want to get their hands on. What type of learner are you? Oh, cool. Yeah. Kinesthetic, visual, visual and kinesthetic, visual and kinesthetic, auditory and visual. Cool. Auditory, visual. It's absolutely okay to be all three. And by the way, like it may depend on what you're learning, right? Yeah, you might switch between preferred styles depending on, on, on what it is you're learning. So learning a hobby, you might, you know, I hate like I gotta get in there and do it. Like I'll, I learned how to paddle board um, a couple, well, about three years ago now. And um, all I wanted to do was do it, like do it. Get on, <laughs> yeah, you too. Yeah, so, so it depends. But if you, I'm not very good in the kitchen. So like if you want me to, especially baking, I just, I'm not a baker. 
Um, and so it, it would be like, show me, I want to watch you do it. I really need to watch you do it. <laughs> so anyhow, um, kind of get the gist of that. But the important, the takeaway here is that you design your courses to appeal to all learning styles because everybody is different. But I want you to keep in mind, if you've never thought about this before, I want you to, to keep in mind now that you know it, what is your preferred learning style and incorporate that learning style into your prep for the exam? How you study, study according to your learning style. Let's talk about the different types of training. So we're gonna talk about on the job and off the job. On the job techniques, um, skill-based and focus on immediate productivity. Um, how many, which of these have you used or have you participated in? Most of us have participated in job instruction type training, right? It's the most popular method, um, mostly for blue collar workers, right? So you're learning how to run the lath machine. You're learning how to operate a forklift. Um, so essentially the, the very first thing you do, of course, is explain the job um, and then demonstrate it. Standard operating procedures are common in job instruction training. Okay, so I'm seeing all kinds of different are there any that are not familiar to you that you say, can we talk about that? They're, they're you know, described in the book along with some, some good examples of when to use them. Okay, I'm not seeing any, then I'm gonna move on because I, you know, I think if you just, if you read in the book, um, yeah, action learning, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more. Um, action learning, an example of that would be, hey, um, we are going to start using a new HRIS system. And um, I want you to participate in the, on the, on the um, project team. And so we're going to test out different HRIS systems. And um, and you're going to be a part of the team that learns how to use the system first. So you're actively involved in the entire process. Um, job shadowing would be another example of action learning. Have any of you done a job shadow? And this is really good, by the way, if you're thinking about getting into HR, you know, you could reach out to people. You're in one now, Lydia. So yeah, does that ring true for you? Action learning? Like you're learning by observing, by being there, you're absorbing, you're watching what people are doing. Yeah. The company I work for has a mentoring program in the direction you want to go. And my mentor is in learning and development. Fabulous. Yep. So, thank you. All right. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, let's talk about off the job training. So there are a lot of different off the job training techniques. Um, and although we use the word training, what does this sound like? Really? We talked about the, when we very first started, I asked you, what's the difference between, so we call it off the job training, but maybe what might be a better term based on the definition? Yeah, education, <laughs> right? I know shadowing is hard sometimes. It's, it's, yeah, part of it is maybe a, a desire to actually do it, like being the kinesthetic type of learner. And sometimes it's just like things move too fast and we need people to slow down. So, um, and it really needs to be set up correctly for job shadowing to work. Yeah, so because though off the job, just remember it's long-term as opposed to on the job training, which leads to immediate increases in productivity where long-term is more for development and education. Um, 
Which of these would you like to talk about? Were they pretty straightforward to you in reviewing? The one that I struggled with was the programmed group exercises. I wasn't exactly sure what they mean by that with the example they used. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so remember, um, so remember when we talked about um, management training and we talked about um, individuals coming together to as a as part of an interview process and we talked about like um, business problems, a group coming together. Maybe we didn't talk about a business problem specifically, but if you think in that context, I know I'm talking about interview or excuse me, yeah, interviewing now, but it's it would kind of be similar to that where you'd have a group of people who come together to solve a particular problem. Um, and you're working together as if it were a real problem. So I think, it, so an example of this could be, um, we're, we are starting to manufacture a new device and we really need to anticipate the problems that might come our way. And so you would put the designers in a room, you'd put the end users in a room, you'd put um, the programmer, the computer programmers in a room, any of the, the stakeholders that are involved that touch that, that uh, new product. And you'd put them in a room and you'd have them identify all of the possible problems that could occur. Um, and then you're gonna like, let's prioritize them. Let's figure out which ones are most important. And let's talk about how we're gonna solve them if they actually do happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got a different feel from that in the book because it, it more sounded like it was um, kind of like learning to work in a group type thing. And in, like, it was more of a broader type training than an individual. So that's why I was kind of confused, but yeah, thank it you, really Kathy. is. No, yeah. you're right. No, I think what your takeaway is absolutely right. Because it, it also involves sort of a, a diagnostic, like what did we, what was our process? How did we go about doing this? How did we work together? So, yeah, so you can, um, you can use it in both applications. Thank you. You're welcome. Micro learning. Yeah. So when I gave you um, the video for yield ratios, that would be micro learning. I'm giving you a video. It's four or five minutes. It's focused on a particular one topic only, and it's isolated. And you, um, so it's a bite sized chunk of a topic. Micro learning could also be, um, depending on what's being delivered in the coach's corner sessions that are on Sunday evenings, micro learning takes place there. If, if one particular topic in the book is explored in depth, but so, so it's, and it's 30 minutes, so it's a bite sized chunk. Could it doesn't always have to be, you know, a video recording or it could be an audio recording, it could be, um, an a brief article. The key is it's brief. It's like no more than five to seven minutes. Some say three to five minutes. It, it's brief. Um, yeah, asynchronous learning networks take place offline. So there is a self-study version of this course. Asynchronous, it's just offline. That means you're not able to make it from eight o'clock to nine o'clock Eastern time because of your work schedule. So you take the asynchronous course and you do it when you're free. So that's asynchronous. You're learning the same content, but you're doing it offline, not with others, as opposed to what are, where now, what is this called? With all of us being together live at the same time. What category does this fall under? Yes, instructor led, what else? Mm. 
e-learning yeah e-learning falls under e-learning teletraining yeah so independent study is um it's where you decide what you're going to study and when you're going to study it so the difference between independent study is that it's typically something that is um generated by you based on your interest um whereas asynchronous learning is already developed and programmed. All right, these are great questions. Let's move on, unless there's something else. Did I miss one? Instructor, microlearning. Okay, I think I, I think I got them all. The key here, I do want to say, um, these are the, the ones that are in yellow. Those are just kind of the ones that we tend to get the most questions about that may not be as familiar to people. And, and I don't know if you ask the questions you know, about asynchronous and micro learning to follow with that form or if you, um, it's just because they're, they're highlighted. Yeah, so. Um, Vestibule training is um, where you go into a um, an actual. It, it's I, I it's it's hard for me to differentiate honestly between vestibule training and and simulations. I don't have a really good example. Um, Vestibule training is, let me, I'm just going to use the example of a bank teller, um, where the, you, you hire a new bank teller, and the bank teller goes to a, um, an offsite location, and that location is an exact replica of the bank, down to the chairs and the, you know, and the person puts on a uniform when they go there, and they, you um, have fake money and they're they're processing their customers come in and they're processing transactions um, so that would be an example of vestibule training simulations um, are uh, more like computer generated i think that's the best way to describe the difference that simulations are more computer training so like pilots for example they'll sit in a cockpit um, and they're there's a simulation that's going on that they have to actively interact with, but it's more of a of a computer. Similar to role playing. Well, role playing is really interesting. Um, I how many raise your hand if you like role playing. You can you can use the I don't know. Do we have those little icons enabled for y'all? No. <laughs> okay. Just like a yes or no, no. Yeah. So some people really like it. Um, and other people do not like it at all. Um, I don't like role playing. Honestly, it's very difficult for me to pretend. I'm just kind of not the pretend kind of person, but, um, but that's just me, right? Like, I, it's just it's just uncomfortable for me. It doesn't mean it's not a good strategy because research actually shows that it that it is a very good strategy. Um, now, particularly when you ask someone to do like a role reversal, so um, that is taking and 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 particularly effective for behavior change or getting people to understand each other when you when you step into the shoes of another person and you sort of do what they do, even when you don't agree with it, it kind of helps shows that it helps to soften a little bit. Maybe it just takes out the judgment, judging other people for doing things the way they do them. I'm not exactly sure. I haven't, you know, I haven't dug into the research on it, but it is shown to be effective. 
Um, and then there's also the, the freeze framing, which is something that would make me absolutely bonkers. So, um, and I, I have had this done actually when I, uh, it was a very, very, very long time ago, probably 20 years ago, I had, I had to be videotaped. I was working with a presentation coach and um, she videotaped me for a, a big presentation I had to give to our board of directors and investors. And it was so painful because there was nobody there. It was me and her and I knew I was being recorded and then I had to watch it back and she'd pause it. You know? So that's the freeze framing that's referenced in the book. Um, I had to pause it and watch back me to talk about it. And it was like, Barbara is the last word I see in chat. Yuck. It was terrible. So anyhow, um, so that's, so it can be valuable and, and you can play the real roles as well. You don't have to do like the role reversal or the freeze framing, but typically in involves some type of diagnostic as well. Meaning let's break this down. What happened? All right, so the major difference between training and education is that training refers more to acquiring blank, blank, whereas education is more broad. Two words. Yeah, football is a great example of the of freeze framing. <laughs> All right. So the correct answer is specific skills. And when you get a fill in the blank, it's really going to be a definition. So flashcards, how many of you love using the flashcards? They're helpful, right? But the definitions for sure. Um, now, I know that we tell you as a test taking strategy, and Jen's going to talk with you about this more tomorrow, not to memorize things. Um, as you're to rely on for being able to pass the test. And, and what, what is meant by that, it's not that it isn't valuable to memorize definitions because in the fill in the blank, you really need to know because you got to fill in the blank. But the, the key is not only knowing the definitions, but also the application. Okay? So take them to application. And yes, I, I, I have to as well. I need to write them out. That's why earlier when we were reviewing the formula for piece rate, I said, write it, write it out because it's that hand to paper to brain coordination. There's, there's you know, proven research that that helps you to remember. Um, I do want to mention that on the practice assessments, when you have fill in the blanks, do not press enter. So here in the chat, you have to press enter so I can see it and everybody can see it. Do not press enter or it's going to count your entry as wrong. Do not put a space. It's okay if you capitalize or don't capitalize. Capitalization should not matter, but do not press enter or it's going to come back as wrong. And you're like, why is this wrong? We are working with HRCI right now um, on that issue. Okay, so that brings us to the end of section 2.1 and we're going to move on. Um, but before we do that, <clears throat> as a reminder, another helpful, helpful, helpful study aid is to take the time to review the self-assessment items. So in this case, at the bottom of page 109, there are seven of them. And I, when I'm like, don't check the box next to, I can describe the difference between training and education until you actually do that. And and you're confident that you have, I'm going to say mastered, but let's say that you're confident that you have mastered that. 
I can list and explain the phases of the systems model of training. So what are the three phases, the three formal phases of the systems model of training? Just share them in chat. And do it, do it from memory, don't look. And if you're not able to do that, then you can't check that box. You've got to immediately flip back in your book to that page where, where the model is described on what page is it? There's an actual exhibit for it. Exhibit 2-1, it's the assessment phase, the training and development phase, and the evaluation phase. So I, if you, you know, if I say, if I'm honest, I couldn't put a check mark by that. I've got to go back and revisit it. All right, here we go. Presenting the training. So delivering the training that you've worked so hard to develop. <clears throat> Come on. So there's a lot more, of course, involved in um, presenting the training than just becoming familiar with the facility. Um, we're going to talk about what's involved here and the things that you should be considering. And there's an additional objective in your book on page 110. We talked about on-site versus off-site training already, um, but on-site training typically take well, it takes place on on site. Here you see some some individuals who are learning how to operate. I'm not sure what that is, but looks like there's some cranes in the background. I'm not sure what that one piece of equipment is. Maybe one of you know, but these are they're maybe heavy equipment operators, and they're learning on the job how to operate the equipment. It takes place on the grounds. Off-site training is um, let's say you go to a hotel um, or you go to one of the types of offsite training was like a ropes course, for example, outdoors type training uh, to build trust and connection and teamwork. So that would be a remote location. It is super important that you understand the facility in which the training is going to be taking, taking, taking place. Um, so what are some things you need to consider? What did you read about in the book? Just share in chat some of the things you need to think about. And that's okay, Barbara. It, it's just like, you, you know, we're all in there, all in this together. It's a good check though, right? Like, can I actually do those things? Those are tied to the objectives. So yeah, lights, sound. Can the people in the back hear you just as well as the people in the front can hear you? Maybe not just as well, but can they hear you? The temperature, the chairs. And by the way, if you know that that, that um, hotel suite that you rented is, or conference suite that you rented is um, not temperature controlled. I, I don't, I've never seen a conference room that has a nest in it. <laughs> Have you? Uh, oh, good for you, Barbara. Yeah, Barbara's saying she has answered all the assessments from day one till today. I just, you know, hats off. It's you're going to get out of this what you put into it and um, you know figuring out how to use your time to the best of your ability but yeah no nests in um, in and I'm so far behind with technology y'all that like if you told me you're going to put a nest in my house I'd be like yeah birds stay outside I don't even I had no idea what that even meant until very recently and I still don't I still can't fathom how it works but anyhow that's for a different day um <clears throat> Okay, so those things are, are very important. Uh, the ventilation in the room, lighting, chairs. Um, the other thing is, what is another major consideration? I haven't seen this so far, unless I missed it. I'm scrolling up. Ooh, snacks, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, the most important. Yeah, 
disabilities. That's right. Yes. So accessibility is is super important. You know, do you have anybody who is going to um, require a sign a sign language interpreter? I was blanking on that. Um, yeah, visual aid. So, you know, when you put your slides on the projector, go to the back of the room. Can you see them? I have to make sure that, you know, the person in the back of the room that we're using font size images, whatever we're using, it's large enough so that the person in the back can also see them. And if we're renting a facility offsite, we also have to think about um, accessibility in terms of handicap ramps, elevators, all that kinds of stuff. Yes, and we're going to talk about the other things that we need to facilitate the training, like the guides and um, other information. So just a little bit of a, a, a review of what we just talked about. All right, and this is an ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act requirement. So training materials, you let us right into this. So thank you for mentioning that. As you know, in this course, you have a lot of training materials. So what are the training, some of the training materials that are provided to you through this course? Like specifically. Yeah, we just talked about flashcards, the book. Mm-hmm. The website, PowerPoints, the Hive, yes, unit slides, online tools, videos, yep, 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 yes. All of those things are training materials. So remember, um, you know, we we do our best to provide you, the learners, with training materials that will appeal to your particular learning preference. I don't know. If we be calling them learning styles, maybe preferences for learning. There's a big debate in the training world about that. It's pretty interesting. Um, so preferences for learning that we're cap, but we're 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 speaking, if you will, to all of you. It is super important. Remember earlier we talked about the decision of do I buy it off the shelf? not customizable. So I'm just going to use that material. And do I buy it off the shelf? It like kind of like a white label and I can modify it and make it my own so I can customize it. But the bulk of the work is done for me or am I designing in-house? And so if you're purchasing a white label that you can change and modify and make your own or you're developing in-house and let's say you well, but what what's a what is a training topic? Just throw a, a potential training topic out there. Maybe a training you recently attended or one that you're aware of. Just so we have a topic to talk about. There's no right or wrong answer. I just want you all to household and estate management training. Okay, what's what's a specific topic in household and estate management? What's a what's a particular task? or job responsibility. Okay, so let's say we're gonna develop a leadership training for the household and estate management um, team, leadership team. And Peter wants to know who are the prominent thought leaders, um, leadership development in leadership development. So who's, who's Peter's best friend in that scenario? Who's your best friend every day when you don't know where to go to find something or when you need to research something? Google, <laughs> right? Yes, the internet, whatever it is. Yeah, I say Google has now become a verb, but yes. So like uh, a proper noun too. Um, yeah, so the internet. So Peter's going to go to the internet. He's going to type in, um, you know, top 10 leadership development experts. 
And then he's going to find a list and he's going to say, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go see what these people have to say. And he's going to do his research and he's going to pick top, he's going to pick three particular leadership models that he's going to train on. Can Peter just learn, 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 and then use it as if he created it, created training based on what he learned without giving the author credit? maybe even asking for permission to use it. No, he must indicate where he got the training. Yes, or, or what he, and where he learned from whom, like he learned what he learned. So according to Patrick Lencioni, there are five dysfunctions of a team and they are one, two, three, four, five, right? He can't just, Think like Peter's five dysfunctions of a team. Um, right. So super important. Yep. Copyright typically tells you um, what rules you need to follow. Some will say, you know, write the author for permission. Um, you know, but generally speaking, you 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 need to um, give credit where credit is due. Not generally speaking, you have to. Um, Generally speaking, oftentimes it's it's okay to to take what you learn from an article, for example, and just reference the article, the author, the expert, without having to go to them specifically to ask for permission. Okay, reproduce. What about reproducing materials? So what if what if? And I think that's what Barbara's getting at. Peter found a um, a worksheet that helps you diagnose which of the five dysfunctions your team has and then what to do about it what if he finds that worksheet what would he need to do yeah you want to avoid plagiarism absolutely in that case he might have to actually contact the author and buy the rights to reproduce that particular handout okay so knowledge check what are the legal restrictions <laughs> I just had a good discussion about this on using copyrighted audio visual materials in a training program. A, there are no restrictions within the United States provided that an admissions fee is not charged for seeing them. B, copyright materials fall under the fair use clause for educational purposes. C, the trainer can view them, but they cannot show to trainees unless the trainer has a licensed agreement. D, an admission fee for all trainees must be paid either by the trainees or the company sponsoring the training. Okay, the correct answer is C. Yeah, so good job. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of this section. There are two self assessment items, but again, go back to the objectives. And when we meet on Wednesday, Wednesday is our day to meet, we are going to be covering lesson six, which is sections 2.3 and 2.4, pages 114 to 126. <clears throat> and those sections are... So 2.3 is evaluation of training effectiveness. And 2.4 is talent management programs. And then remember tomorrow you have the study tips and recommendations tutorial. And if you are not able to make it to that, that's okay. There will be a recording. So we're finishing up a couple minutes early. If you have to run, have a wonderful evening and I'll see you back here on Wednesday. And if you have questions, <clears throat>
go ahead and share in chat. And I know Christina, there was a- I have a question. Yes. Um, on lesson three, I'm not able to access the knowledge checkpoint. It says it won't be available till March 7th. On lesson three, the knowledge checkpoint, interesting. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Sorry about that. Until March 7th? Is that what yeah, you said? that's what it says. I try to click on it and it gives me an error and it says um, available till Monday, March 7th, 7 p.m. Oh. And that's lesson three. <laughs> Much. Sorry about that. And who is that asking? Patricia. Patricia Lopez. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, what's Okay, oh, Sydney asked, do we not calculate 0.75 times 680? And that was in the sample I gave. Um, Stephen, is that correct? Is it Stephen? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I am sorry, I have not posted it. I promise it'll be there tomorrow. I was sick. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little behind. I'm sorry about that. No problem. I'm glad you're looking at it and notice it's not there. <laughs> I just had a quick question with um, in regards to the taking the test. Uh, is it like, are you not supposed to uh, open like another tab or something like that? You definitely, absolutely do not open HRCP twice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because the system flags that as you can only be logged in once. Oh, okay. Because I was taking up one of the practice tests and I think I got like an email or something. I just went to go check it. I wasn't sure like if that was going to mark it as something. Okay. And if you do get locked out, then you have to contact HRCP to explain, you know, hey, here's what I was doing. Um, okay. S Sam um, stands for successive approximation method. And it's another model for training development. Okay, let me come go back. Let me get my slides again. Let me go back to that example. Because I think what happened is that I just, um, Yeah, I think I, I um, what happened there, Sydney, um, is that I, I, I mistyped. It, it was a typo on my part. So I will definitely correct it when I share the slides. Um, but just to go back to them and show you again, uh, what I accidentally did is I, I typed the hours here instead of 680. So yes, you are absolutely right. Um, this number 510 is correct. I just, it just, it was just a typo, but it's so important. And I do, I do apologize for that. So good, excellent catch. The calculation should be correct, except for this is supposed to be, as someone pointed out, I have to round that up. I'm just going to change my calculation here. So I'll fix these before I send this out as well. Hopefully that clears that out. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, let's see, the recordings are located. Let me share my, stop sharing this and I will share something different. If I can get to the hive. Oh, oh I have so many tabs open. Tell me, are you, can, are you seeing the hive now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so the recordings for your lessons are um, for each lesson. So 
So this is the one from last Wednesday. The recordings from the tutorials, you'd scroll all the way down to the bottom and they're gonna be under the topic. So this is where the you know, course navigation and GPS tutorial in case you missed that. Now this one is scheduled for tomorrow, the study tips and recommendations. So after that, you'll be able to come here to, to find that recording. Okay. And then okay. you can also get the slides. Okay, the slides for um, the lessons are in here. Yes, so the slides are, are, well, for the lessons, the slides are under the um, resource center. So you scroll all the way back, all the way up to the top and under resource center. So you scroll down a little bit. Curriculum and unit slides are posted. Okay, here. okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And who is that talking? Tahaya. Tahaya, hello. Hello. With the knowledge checkpoints, can you compare your answers with the correct responses? Stephen, what do you mean by that? I was just curious, like I submitted my answers and I didn't like use any notes or anything. So I don't know if like I'm a hundred percent accurate. So I was just wondering if there's any way to like cross check, like what you maybe hit and didn't hit, what was maybe like accurate and maybe what like should have been added. Oh, I see the knowledge checkpoints, not, not here in class on, on the hive. Yes. On the hive. Ah, yes. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to look into that. Let me ask. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I want to say there is, but I I want to say that there's a guide that I have, but I need to I need to check on that. Okay, yeah, because I didn't know like if I was typing something, there was maybe like one thing that wasn't accurate. I'm like, oh, it'd probably be nice to know that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Of course it would. Yeah. Thank you. The calculations that you were showing at the beginning. Will, will that be part of the recording? I'd like to kind of like sit down and think about that and review those a little bit. Will all those extra slides at the beginning be part of the recording? Yes, I did start the recording early. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, y'all, thank you for being here. I'll see you Wednesday, but reach out to me if you have any questions.